characteristics and also what will well, some points that makes good forecasts. Um, here we have also well, a figure which shows the forecast horizon. Uh, we have a short horizon which may be uh, defined as days or weeks, uh, short time sales, the shift schedules of workers, resource requirements, this is some typical forecasting, uh, well, the examples what we need to forecast on, on this uh, uh, short uh, uh, horizon. And then we also talk about the intermediate horizon which goes from well, weeks up to, to months, uh, where you can decide about a product family on the short time you have uh, a more detailed specific uh, product on the, on the intermediate uh, part you can talk about a family of products um, labor needs you need to employ more workers not only the, the shift where when the workers should work but also you need uh, more or eventually less uh, and also resource uh, uh, requirements will be uh, defined to be uh, in, in that uh, uh, horizon some resources might be uh, be ordered by a, a short uh, lead time, others might lead, need some, some longer time to be delivered. And we talk about the long horizon, which is from months and up to years. And then we need to make some more uh, serious uh, decision about capacity. Maybe we should buy another machine if we need to. We, we can see that we will have uh, an increased uh, demand than uh, or sales, then we need to buy another machine or, uh, for uh, more to be, to be able to have more production. Also, we have some long term sales patterns and also some trends. How is the trend in this market? Is, the, is there a, a, a growth or, a, or an increasing trend, or is it a decreasing trend that you expect to sell less of that product than you actually have done uh, earlier? So, here we can see different types of, uh, 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 of sales or, or demand, for example. Uh, we have the demand in the y-axis and the time in the x-axis, and we can see in this first example here that this seems to be random. There's no pattern here. We have the first day or first week, we will have the sales which uh, represent this point. And then it seems to be a bit lower, but then it increases and decreases. And uh, when you can uh, maybe are trying to identify a trend increasing in this case, and you suddenly have a low uh, demand, which will well, more or less destroy this, uh, this trend here. So here, this seems to be more or less uh, random. And uh, to find the expected or, or demand or to make a forecast here, you should probably just try to to find the average demand all over time, if you don't expect the demand to, to change over time. Uh, on the next figure here, we can rather see that here we have a linear trend. We will have some variation, but the variation will be along a trend line which looks like that. We can clearly see that here we expect to sell more it, and when the time uh, at the end of the time uh, horizon than at the start of the time horizon. Even if there are variation, the variation will be among a trend line, which looks like this. And we can see here that we have a more uh, exponential uh, development of, of the sales. We start rather low, and then it starts to increase a bit, and then it's increasing very high. And of course, nothing can continue to forever, so at some time, and that's what will also happen with the, with the demand in uh, a linear demand at some time, uh, point of time, it, this will, will stop. But uh, uh, well, when we are forecasting within a limited time horizon, this is uh, maybe this is possible to use models which uh, uh, at least uh, predict some, some linear trends here. It's much uh, more difficult when the trend is quadratic or exponential because then you will have a very high growth and at some point probably quite soon this growth has to stop, uh, it will not continue forever. Uh, but still this can for a short or limited time period, this can also be, uh, be a, a way to try to, uh, to forecast the demand when you suddenly everyone wants that particular product, some kind of fashion or, uh, or a very popular product for, for a shorter time. And 
here, we can see that we, in, well, we both have a linear trend. We expect to sell more at the end of the time horizon than we do at the start of the time horizon. But in addition, we have seasons. Typical seasons of a year. We have the winter season, the spring, the summer, and, and the fall. Or it could also be more detailed uh, seasons, like uh, some products are typical Christmas gifts, for example. Then you will have a very small demand, or a relatively small demand, most of the year. And then you will suddenly have a very high increase at the end of the year, in November and, and December. And also some other, uh, other typical seasonal uh, products. So here you can have seasons either on a straight line, season around a straight line, or in this example, you have both a season, uh, you have both seasons and a linear growth. So the seasons will vary regularly along a trend line, which in this case is increasing, but it can also be uh, be decreasing. Uh, we will uh, in this course look at uh, well, first we will look at stationary series. Then we will try to identify trends, and then we will look at seasonal uh, or methods to identify uh, uh, ident uh, or to, to forecast when you have season, both seasons <coughs> without a trend and season when you have uh, have a, a trend or linear trend increasing or, or decreasing. We will not look at this. Uh, that will be a bit more complex, and also as mentioned, this is will be for relatively short periods because of the very high growth here, which cannot actually continue forever. So let's first look at some notations, because now we're going to find formulas. We need to represent the different variables and different uh, uh, well, uh, elements in the formulas. And when we are talking about the D, we are talking about the, the actual demand. This is the past values of the series to be predicted. If, uh, well, uh, when you are making a forecast, you usually look at historical uh, values. And if you have last year's values, you might have the demand for all the months last year. Then you have 12 different values for the D variables. You have D1 for January, D2 for February, and D12 for, for December last year, for example. These values are known, and they should be used when making a forecast. The actual forecast. Um, yeah, also here, if you are making a forecast in period T, we can also assume that we have negative numbers here. We can make a forecast in period uh, uh, 12 and uh, for, for period 13, which is January next year. But we can also talk about negative numbers, for example, if, you d if it's a matter of, of definition, that what we define number, the period number T to be. But when in we are in one particular period T, we know the demand in the previous period, and we'll make a forecast for the coming period. And then we talk about the F, and this means that we make a forecast in period T for period T plus, and this is a Greek letter tau, which might be one. This means that we are making a forecast for next period, next month, or it might be two, if we are making a forecast for the, the month to two months from now, or period two periods from now, or so on. So this can be uh, any positive number from, from zero and up to, to one, uh, whatever the highest number we want to use in, in our forecasting horizon. So when we are defining the F notation, the forecast, and use T as the forecast period, we are in actually now, and we are going to forecast for the period T plus tau. Sometimes we also just skip that one. That means that we are, by definition, in the current period and are forecasting for period T plus tau. One period or two periods or three periods in, in advance. Uh, also, we talk about this, which is the forecast in the previous period for the current period. And now, 
when we are in the current period. We can also we can uh, we can compare the forecast with the actual demand because we know the demand in in the current period. We ha we made a forecast in the previous period or uh, or uh, even longer ago, and then we should try to compare the forecast to the actual demand in uh, uh, in in this. Uh, in this uh, uh, period. So, uh, but uh, anyway, if you are using the notation like this, the first number will be the forecast, the period when you made the forecast, and the last uh, in the index number here will be the period for the forecast. So, we will now look at how to evaluate forecasts. And then we talk about forecast error. And as you can see here, uh, we just talked about the forecast made in a previous period for the current period. The forecast error is of course the difference between the forecast and the actual demand. Denoted as the small e with index number t. This is the forecast error for period T when you compare the actual demand with the forecast made in one previous period. And for one step ahead forecast, we can just skip the first part here. So we just use the notation F of T minus B of T. We compare with the forecast made in, in, the, uh, in the previous period. And MAD mean average deviation is one common way to evaluate the forecast. We will look at different forecasting techniques in this course and a way to evaluate it is not necessary. We cannot just point at one method and say that this forecast method is the best one because this is different. Sometimes we mo one forecast method is, um, is better for, for one product in one market. Another technique is better in, in another market for, for other products. And here we use for example, the MAD, the mean average deviation, to compare the different techniques. Mean average deviation, you have the formula there. One divided by N, number of periods you have forecasted for. If you are comparing the forecast for last year, for example, and might be each month of, of, of last year, uh, which means that you have 12 data points to compare with. Um, or you might have used week or, or any other time period. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, let's just use the notation here, n, which is the number of periods we are comparing, and multiplying by the sum of the absolute value of the forecast error. Then it doesn't matter if you are forecasting too much or too, too little. Uh, the by this definition, the for wait some, <laughs> sorry, Let's try again. This forecasting error is the forecast minus the demand, but it could as well be the opposite since we are talking about the absolute value here. The deviation from the exact uh, measured demand. And we have another typical uh, way of uh, uh, or measure of, of the technique, which is called the MSE, the mean squared error, which also divides by N the number of, of data points. And now instead of multiplying by the sum of the absolute value, you take the square of the uh, forecast error to the power of t. And then, of course, it will always be positive. Uh, the difference here, this will, of course, be a much higher number since you take the, the square of, of the forecast error. And the difference is, well, they are these measures are good to use in, in different uh, uh, situations. Sometimes it is okay uh, to uh, have a forecast which is uh, uh, quite close to the uh, to the to the exact uh, value. Then, uh, well, 
is a huge problem with a large deviation or large difference between the forecast and the actual demand, then this might be the best way to, to measure, to try to, to find the technique, which could vary, but will not, uh, well, will show that uh, a very high uh, value when you have very high deviation. So here, in this MAD forecast error, when you have, let's assume that we have a forecast looking like this, and you have very small values here, and then suddenly a very high deviation here, this one will be relatively much uh, more important when you use the MSE, because this difference between the forecast and the actual demand to the power of two will be much higher and will dominate all the other data points uh, much more. So here you can say that the MAD in this situation would still be relatively small because all the other data points are close to the forecast and you have only one or a very, very few um, data points which is very far away from the, um, from the forecast. By using the MSE, this will be relatively important and you will have a very high value. In another situation where the difference from the forecast and the, uh, and, and the exact demands are actually larger, these differences are in general much larger than these differences, but you don't have this very huge uh, deviation in one or a very small number of, of data points, then you might find out that this is better, the mean squared error gives a better result than the MAD, because you don't have this huge difference to the power of two, which will totally dominate all, all the others. And here, it's a matter of uh, the measure you should use. It's a, it's a matter of what, what is important in, in your for your product in, in your particular industry. If you should try to avoid these type of, of data points, you might use, um, or try, try to avoid this very huge uh, deviation, you might use the MSE to, to compare the techniques instead of the MAD because so uh, they will be so problematic with uh, with a so high, uh, high difference in uh, uh, from the forecast and, and the demand. Anyway, we have two, well this of course we have lots of others, but these are the two most common ways to measure the forecast error. The MAD, which is the, the average absolute value of the deviation, and the MSE, which is the uh, the average square of the deviation from the forecast and, and uh, to the data point. We also talk about what we call the MAPE. Which is the, um, the percentage, the forecast error given in percentage, which is defined as 1 divided by M, multiply by the square root of the absolute value of the demand, uh, the error divided by the demand. And then you can multiply by 100 to get the percentage. Like this. So this is actually the same as the uh, MAD, but it is given in a percentage instead of an act exact value. <coughs> Okay, then we should look at uh, the first. Let's see. The first situation shown here. The situation where you have no recognizable pattern. And we can assume that we have it, uh, what we call a stationary series. We have the same expected demand independent of time period. We don't know exactly what the demand will be, but we expect to be, based on uh, uh, on, uh, on previous year's uh, experience and the, and the average sales, that we will sell around the average for a 
certain number of time periods uh, in, in from the history. So then we have two different methods, which we will show in, in this course, to predict the expected demand for stationary theory. And the first one we will talk about is the, what we call the, the moving average, denoted as the MA. And the second one is called the exponential smoothing, ES. So, here we talk about uh, stationary series, and a stationary time series has the form like this. The actual demand is the, this is the Greek letter mu, uh, which is the, uh, the, yeah, the actual demand for one period is the expected demand, here denoted as, as the mu, and then the forecast error, shown here as the epsilon of t. So, the mu, the expected demand, is a constant what we expect to sell in any time period. Because now we have stationary series, we don't know uh, about any uh, dependentness, we don't know about any uh, trends or, or seasons. We will expect to sell the same number of products every day, independent of, uh, of which, uh, which day it is. And then the forecast error will be a random variable, or will be at least a variable measured by from um, between zero and this uh, variance, which is denoted as the uh, sigma, the standard deviation to the power of two uh, from, from the statistics. So here we know by studying the historical data, we know what we expect. This is usually the average value, uh, the expected demand, and we also know about the standard deviation and the variance by studying or, or analyzing the time, uh, the, the series of, of historical data. So the actual demand in one time period will be the expected demand and plus, and this can also be a negative value, which is the error, error term, the difference from the expected demand and to the actual demand. And as mentioned, two common methods. One is the moving average, and the second, exponential smoothing. We'll go through both of these in, uh, in this course. At least the first time, the, the first one, the moving average is now, and probably exponential smoothing next time. This is the definition for moving averages. And we can explain it like this. The arithmetic average of the n, which is the number of data points, most recent observation. And for a one-step-ahead forecast, we look like this. The forecast for the next time period will be 1 divided by n, and uh, well, of course, here we could the capital N, and uh, capital N is the same as the uh, small n here. Uh, it is the number of time periods used in, in this uh, forecast. So we use the forecast as the average of the demand in the previous, the second previous, the third previous, and the end most recent previous uh, the data from, the, from, uh, from history. And the decision here is how many periods you should include. This is the moving average, so next period we will have a new data point for the current period, and we will exclude the oldest one from, uh, from the data we are using for, for the forecast. Uh, 
so I will just uh, yeah. I will go through one one example now from from the textbook uh, uh, on page 65 if you have, have the book and here we have a certain number of uh, observations we know we can assume that we are in period number well at the end of period number three we have data for three periods or the these have the follow following uh, values first 200 that is the data the sales or the demand in the first period then we have the data or the demand in the second period which is 250 and in the third period it is 175 this is now d1 d2 and d3 so we want to make a forecast for period number four by using this data and using the moving average method and the forecast for we can denote it like this from period three to period number four or we can just say that we make the forecast for period number four from the period before so it's this means that we are only going one period ahead then the expected demand based on these three data values is 200 plus 250 plus 175 divided by 3. We have three data points, n is equal to 3. So we take the three most recent ob observations and divide by the number of observations. And uh, this will give uh, approximately 208, if we are dealing with integer numbers, we don't, don't care about the fractions. So now, the moving averages technique in this small example will give us an expected demand of 208. And this is the forecast for period 4, when we have data for period one, two, and three, one, two, and three available. But this is also the, the forecast for the coming period because here we are dealing with stationary series. We don't have a trend. We don't have seasons. If we make a forecast, this is the forecast which will be valid until we get some new information. So if we are asked about making a forecast for period five, we will actually get the same number, period six, seven, whatever. This is now the forecast based on the moving averages technique and the demand values shown here. Three most recent values. So the conclusion here, based on the three first period, we will have an expected demand of 208 in the future. So we get a new observation. Next one. Uh, the demand in period number four was not 208, we didn't find the exact number, but we found uh, the demand to be 186. And now we should make a new forecast, we should update the forecast. For period 5 and for period 5, we are now in period 4, or we have data for four periods, but our n value here, our decision is to include the three most recent data observations. So we just skip the oldest one. We replace the oldest one with the new data here. So the new value will be 250 plus 175 plus 186 and still divided by 3. So the new 
forecast will now be approximately 204, which is the forecast for period 5 and also the forecast for any other period into the future, until we get some new information. Uh, and of course, we get a new observation in period number 5, which is now said to be uh, 225. So we can see they are varying here. There's no clear trend. 200, 250, 175, 186, 225. No clear trend here. This is, seems to be quite random. But we have a new observation, 225. We will replace the oldest one used in the data set. So now the forecast for period 6 is 175 plus 186 plus 225. and still divided by 3, which is mm -hmm. 200 and yeah, I haven't actually calculated this, someone can might maybe help me, but uh, it should be maybe a bit smaller because we are replacing a high value 250 with a smaller value 225. So I will assume 195. Okay, thank you. To calculate, add these three numbers and divide by, by 3. So 195. So this is the way to use the moving averages technique. Just replace the oldest data point with the new data point when you get one. Still use the same number of periods or data points to include in this technique. So we can see the forecast error and here forecast error 208 minus what you actually found 186 which is 22 here we forecasted 204 minus what you actually found the year to be in period 5, 225. And here this is a negative number, minus 21, but when you are finding the, the MAD, for example, or the, the mean average deviation, we talk about the absolute value. And of course we don't know yet the uh, value of the demand for period 6, so we can't find the forecast error until we get a new data point for, for this uh, value here, for, for, for this uh, period there. So here, the mean absolute deviation based on these two numbers, 22 plus 21 divided by, uh, by 2 is 21 and, and a half, since we are talking about absolute value. And we can also find the mean squared error, which is 22 to the power of 2 plus 21 to the power of 2 and divided by 2, which is a much higher number. So, I will just show the Excel sheet which shows this example. This is the moving averages for uh, for this uh, data series, and we can see that uh, we update the demand here. We find the moving average. Here we also use fractions. It should actually be uh, we skip this if we are talking about uh, uh, integer numbers. So every time we are getting a new data point, we are updating the moving averages uh, forecast, and as we can see here, 208, approximately 204, 195, and then suddenly we get a new data point of 285, we 
which of course will affect the, the forecast for the next period and we will still get a very high demand in period 7 which will uh, affect the next period here 271 and then suddenly we have a very high de decrease of the uh, of the demand in period number 8 and that means that the next value here will be smaller so at every time you can see the formula in Excel here add the three previous values and divide by three and this is the numbers for the uh, yeah this is the actual deviation and this is the square of the deviation and you can find the MAD and the MSD values here we can also uh, as uh, shown in the next columns here if we are using six data points then we have to divide by six and add the six most recent numbers shown here then b2 to b7 six data points and divide by six and also here you can find the mad and the msd uh, values uh, the graph here shows the this is the actual demand and this is the forecasted demand and what we can see quite clear here is that if we have a trend because the actual demand will show a trend from period number four to number seven even if we have a very high de decrease here we can just well assume that we, we don't know about it so based on these four data points we could assume that here there is an increasing trend and this trend is not uh, discovered by the MAD techniques until a few periods later so here the actual demand showed here will come into effect from here we can see that the forecast will register this uh, uh, demand uh, th this increased uh, trend and this might be uh, I'm not sure if we can call it problem but uh, uh, what some of the things we, we should know about regarding the, the moving average uh, because it uh, since all the data points have the same weight it will not discover the trend until a few periods uh, later we have some advantages here shown it is quite easy to understand it is quite easy to compute uh, at least when you have a, a spreadsheet like excel and it will provide you with a stable uh, forecast but some disadvantages uh, you need to save all the past n data points you need to know about the history from well, store everything you should of course have the history anyway so i'm not sure if this is a very high uh, disadvantage uh, but uh, as just mentioned it will lay behind a trend it will not discover a trend until there are have gone some some time period and if you have a high value of n if you use six instead of three for example the trend will be discovered even later because all the data points will have the same weight the most recent point will be the same have the same weight as the point which is oldest in in the in the history and also it ignore compl more complex relationship in data uh, seasons and, and even more com complex relationship which we will come back to, to later so here we can just see about this mo moving average method if we have a trend in the demand here the moving average with an n value of 3 will just discover it here it will be behind and the moving average with 6 as the uh, uh, n value will be even further behind to discover uh, the trend so this method is not uh, well if you have some relationships or, or trends this is not maybe not uh, so good but if you have stationary time series you don't expect uh, well you expect the demand to be approximately the same for the coming periods as it has been in, in the previous one then it could be a good technique to, to try to, to make work and next method which we will start uh, also next uh, week not next week in two weeks is 
the exponential smoothing method, which is a bit different. Still, we are talking about stationary series, but now the most recent observation is more important than the older one, and you will have an alpha value, which will tell the in exact value of the importance. How much more should the most recent data point be, uh, be with than the other one? Okay, that's enough for today. And as mentioned, no lectures next week, so we'll meet again in uh, two weeks.